Ladies and gentlemen, record geeks, retired plate spinners, and millennials who want to impress their parents with their record collections. Welcome to the Rhino Cast Podcast, brought to you by Rhino Records. Get ready for new releases, deep tracks, and conversations with your favorite artists and bands. And balloons for the kiddies. And now, your hosts with the most, Rich Mahan and Dennis the Menace. On this episode of the Rhino Podcast, we have part one of our conversation with Grace Slick. Volunteers of America! Volunteers of America! Volunteers of America! Volunteers of America! Hey, Dennis. Hey, Rich. I am on Rhino.com right now because I am checking out the album of the day, which happens today, the day we're recording this, to be Todd Rundgren's Utopia. Todd is God. He's awesome. I watched a documentary on him recently, a lot of interviews. I don't think people realize how many albums he produced. Anyway, I digress. Rhino.com has so much amazing information. I love learning about music. I signed up for the Rhino album of the day, and it comes into my inbox every day. There's links on the side. I can stream it right from my computer while I'm working and listen. It gives me something new to listen to every day, and then there's a little bit of info to read about with it. It's great. I love it. Besides that, on Rhino.com, of course, you can listen to all of our past podcast episodes. And there are other great new releases that are announced. For instance, the replacements Dead Man's Pop. The 4CD 1LP Deluxe is coming this fall, and Replacements fans are going to love this one. Not to mention, hint, hint, two-part podcast coming up on that release. But this podcast episode, we have something very special. You, Dennis, and the executive producer of the Rhino Podcast, John Hughes, got to visit Grace Slick at her home in Malibu, did you not? 80 years old, just turned 80. And she is still a pistol and then some. And I'm told that the conversation went so well that we have enough for two podcasts on this one. Indeed. Part one, deep history, Jefferson Airplane, and a little bit of politics. Let's get to the conversation that you and executive producer John Hughes had with Grace Slick. Grace Slick, welcome to the Rhino Podcast. Well, thank you. You are. How do we know you actually are Grace Slick, by the way? Because I swear a lot. <laughs> and you know it's podcasts. I think we're okay, aren't we? I, we have the explicit language uh, thing on iTunes, so we're good. We're covered. Yeah, and this is, <laughs> this is, this is interesting, because this is Dennis and John Hughes. So. Yeah, well, you know, interesting. I, I, I just want to take a second and thank you for letting us in your house. This is amazing. Uh, I have to be honest, I'm a little starstruck. This is really, (laughs) really cool. Well, thank you. But you know what's amazing? What people don't know is what all the discussions that just went on for the 15 minutes while we were setting up. Yeah, that's why I kept saying, save it for the podcast, Dennis. I know, I know. I know, yeah, it keeps whispering out here. Come on, Dennis, you just gave away the whole thing. (laughs) Don't give away the store. Exactly. So I only have the Wikipedia version of your life before the airplane. I know Chicago. I know college on and off. Can you tell us, I don't want the Wikipedia, I want the Gracepedia. Can you tell us a couple of stories that's going to kind of start to inform people as we launch into all of this wonderful I wish. Us? People uh, have come up, uh, publishers and uh, a couple of movie guys, and I said, look, you don't want to do it. It's too boring. I don't have any of these stories where my father beat me or, or uh, everybody left and went to Arizona or whatever happens to people. <laughs> My life was literally leave it to Beaver. But at a certain point, as you were growing up and uh, in your late teens, for me, some people are earlier, they're smarter, you go, this is stiff, it's boring, nobody steps out of line, the clothes are ugly, we're talking about the 1950s, the clothes are stupid, 
the uh, my parents were Eisenhower Republicans, which means they were not crazy the way the Republicans are today. Now, if you're a Republican listening, you're crazy, okay? What, what, what in God's name makes you uh, stand up for a guy like Donald Trump? He's a joke. So anyway, uh, my early stuff was uh, easy. Nobody fought. Nobody beat me. My parents didn't get divorced. I went to regular schools in Palo Alto. Nothing ever happens in Palo Alto. It's a flat college town. You can ride your bike anywhere. I mean, it's just so boring that there's no reason to make a movie or a book out of it. So, so I have to lie a lot if, if you want to make it interesting. <laughs> so, so it's interesting because there's all these statistics that there was more drug use in small towns than there are in major cities, right? So... Maybe where, now, but not then. Right. So where, Palo Alto, I know it well, because I live pretty close. When did the hunger happen? What, what, I always ask people who grew up in normal places, what flipped the switch? I went into a store to buy a song called La Bamba. When I was 18, I was in, I went to the University of Miami. I didn't go there to learn anything. I went there because it was called a fun college, and it was. But I went in to buy that La Bamba, and I was walking to a regular record store. We had stacks of records you could look through. And there, as I walked by, there was a picture of a guy having a picnic in a graveyard. And at that time, you didn't have very many things like that. And I looked at it, well, what is this? It was Lenny Bruce. So I bought it. And I thought I was going to die laughing. That flipped, Lenny Bruce basically flipped the switch. So I, when I went back to California uh, after my sophomore year in college, uh, it, everything was changing. And the rest of my friends had all had their uh, switches flipped as well by one thing or the other. So we were, uh, get together and listen to new music, which was... Uh, Miles Davis, Gil Evans, Sketches of Spain, uh, Shorter, uh, you know, all the jazz guys. Because actual rock and roll, rhythm and blues was, had ha been happening. But rock and roll in 1958 was Frankie Avalon. I, no, sorry, don't like it. Uh, but then that changed as well. So within a period of a couple of years, stuff was changing for everybody. And we all fell into it very easily. There was no problem going from really stiff 50s into running around nude in Marin County playing rock and roll. It just was very easy move. It was natural. It seemed like this is what's got to happen. You were a bird and you lived very high. You dreamed the wind when the breeze came by. Say to the wind as it took you away. So getting to San Francisco, did you wear flowers in your hair while wearing nice clothing in I Magnon in Union Square, which is now a Macy's, by the way? Because you, you've said that it wasn't really modeling, it's more like being a, a live traveling mannequin. Well, it was modeling. It was live modeling, not f photographic modeling. I'm too short for a photo model. But what I did was I worked in the couturier department of I Magnus, which was on the third floor. Usually I can't remember my name, so I, how do I remember it was on the third floor? I don't know. <laughs> and you change your clothes about every five or ten minutes and just walk around. And they'd have you know, uh, shows occasionally. And they used to hate to have me in there because my head is very big for women's hats. And they, you, you get your gloves and your hats and some jewelry just before you go down the runway. So <laughs> they'd be going, you know, <laughs> trying to jam the hat on my head. And, stuff. and I was too short. I was only 5'7". Now I'm 5'6", because you, your back goes down when you get older. But uh, too short for a photo model, so I was, uh, was a uh, floor model, which is what they called it. And some old, fat old woman, she looked like I do now, came up to me, and, and she fe felt my elbows. She said, oh, honey, you need cream on your elbows. 
And I still don't need cream on my elbows, okay? Who does? And I don't know. Some people get gnarly elbows, I, I guess. guess. But anyway, I looked at her and I thought, you need cream from head to toe. <laughs> Wait, whole others productive, you know. He produces the finest of sound. Putting drumsticks on either side of his nose. Snorting the best licks in town. It was stuff like that, and at that time, uh, my husband at the time, Jerry Slick, and that's where I got the name. Uh, it's a real name, weird, but real. Uh, we went to see a group called Jefferson Airplane play at a place called The Matrix. And I looked at that, and I thought, okay, my mother was a singer, and I can do that, because I'm young and stupid. And I thought, I, I can do that. So that's what I did, stopped modeling, and Jerry Slick and his brother, Darby, who wrote Somebody to Love, and I, and another guy named David Miner, and uh, a couple guy, more guys formed a group called The Great Society. We were making fun of Lyndon Johnson's mm -hmm. thing, but, and it worked. We would open for Jefferson Airplane. Was there any thought back then about, you know, how unusual it was to have a female-fronted rock band? No, because in San Francisco, there was a female who used to sing occasionally with the Grateful Dead. Mm -hmm. Janice was singing. There was an all-girl group called the Ace of Cups. Uh, the Charlottes would occasionally have this girl. So it wasn't unusual in San Francisco. It may have been in Kansas, but not in San Francisco. And what, do you chalk up your courage just to youth? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I've always been fairly comfortable on a stage. Mm -hmm. Now, I have my, one of my best friends is horrified by that. She, she'd rather jump off the roof of this building than sing. I said, really? I said, do you ever sing in the shower? She said, oh, maybe. I said, but not in front of people, huh? No. And everybody has their stuff, what they're afraid of and or not. And I just don't, I'm not afraid of a stage. I figure you practice whatever the hell it is you're doing and then go on and do it. <laughs> Did you have any kind of resistance when you guys started touring uh, to people, when people were just like, you know, oh, this is a strange setup, or was it just kind of off you go? No, we loved it. We went, played in uh, uh, Louisiana, and uh, I think it was New Orleans, and we showed up the first year we played, it was 68 probably, maybe 67. They all had on 50s outfits, little corsages with big fancy dresses and hair, and the little guys with their dumb-looking suits on and everything. We came back the next year, they had totally changed. Bell-bottoms, tie-dye, guys with long hair. So the, the flip was really fast. Someone to Love, notice I said Someone to Love. Yeah. That was out on Autumn Records, and there was this Sylvester Stewart guy who was Sly Stone. Was he involved? Yeah. Uh, we recorded at uh, Golden Gate in San Francisco, which was a very, it was a fairly small studio, but we couldn't really play worth a damn. So he played every instrument. Hmm. And uh, it, whatever that recording is, I haven't even heard. I don't know. That would know. be amazing to find. Yeah. I bet it's out there somewhere. But Big Daddy Tom Donahue. I was just going to say K-San. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, it's right he, here. He was there, too. He had something to do with either ownership in, in Golden Gate Records. But Sly was amazing. But we were just people who thought it would really be fun to have a rock and roll band. When the truth.
early versions of the songs. And we'll get into the newer versions. But at that time, these were different versions of, of the songs that eventually became hits, the two that became the big hits. So Columbia offered you, if I'm correct, Columbia offered you a contract, but right at that moment, you replaced the singer of the band that, that uh, we're obviously going to yeah, get into. Yeah, the, the band uh, was weird because they got pretty much the same thing. They're, the girl that I replaced was a dark-haired Norwegian, which is what I am, and with a low voice. Hmm. Now, she has a different kind of voice. And I'm more of a stare at you and the audience wander around the stage entertainer. She stood very still and would pat her thigh, so she wasn't really into uh, shtick. I was more into the shtick of it, but it was natural. I didn't plan it. It's just how I felt when, when I was singing whatever song I was singing. So we're slightly different as entertainers, but same genetic makeup. And I don't think they did it on purpose. It's just uh, our band, Great Society, was breaking up because the guys were going to go study in India, which was very popular at the time. And uh, she, Signe Anderson, was going to live in Oregon, have a baby with her husband. So uh, Jack Cassidy, who was a bass player for Airplane, came up and said, would you like to join? Said, you betcha. Hmm. Basically, because I loved his bass. He's an amazing bass player. So you joined the Airplane, and arguably, you brought them the two biggest hits. Were they aware at the time? Did they kind of say, oh, we have to do no, when none of us were aware. The, the uh, record company picked the hits, picked the, the singles. We didn't have anything to do with it. We'd, I'd like something, and they'd say, no, it's not a single. Went, okay, you were running the show. So the record company, RCA was very uh, liberal and easy with us at the time. They let us say anything. Uh, I mean, uh, Paul Kantner in one of his songs says, up against the wall, motherfucker. They let us keep it. The only time they objected to anything was Paul suggested very subtly that Jesus and Mary Magdalene were a couple. And the head at that time of RCA, they went, we went through about five presidents of RCA. But at the time when he wrote that, the guy wrote that, the guy was a Catholic. So Paul had arguments for hours every day for a week, which he recorded with the head of RCA talking about whether or not he could say, uh, suggest that it's possible that Jesus had a relationship with Mary Magdalene. Really? Up against the wall, motherfuckers, okay? But maybe Jesus and Mary Magdalene were a couple is not okay? You guys keep changing precedents. Uh, <laughs> you know, so uh, that was the only time they ever objected to lyrics. The electrical dust is starting to rust Her trapezoid thermometer taste All the red tape is mechanical rape Of the TV program waste Data control and IBM Science is mankind's brother But all I see is draining me On my plastic fantastic lover One of the things that you've said and, you know, I listen to Serialistic Pillow, and I, I know every inch of it because I got a copy of it from some hippies when I was very, very young. There was a lot of substances in the, in the session and a lot going on. Oh, yeah. So how does... And one of the things that you've talked about is that your producer was so out of it that you pretty much worked with the engineer. Yeah, he was uh, more inclined to be doing alcohol. And alcohol is stronger than almost any drug. Most people don't think that. They oh, alcohol. It's a, it's a drug, and it's really powerful. Oh, yeah. So uh, he was uh, kind of a little bit too loaded. Now, marijuana is good with music. You pay attention. You can hear it. You enjoy it. You can uh, parse it. It, it. It's not a bad drug. LSD is good, but it's questionable because you might decide that the walls are going to fall on you any minute in the middle of a bass solo or something. You know, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's not uh, reliable. Right. It can be good. 
when you're going up or coming down, when you're not really out there, it can be good. Alcohol, no. Cocaine uh, can be okay. I mean, I, I'm not pushing drugs here. I'm just talking about what happened with us, mainly, as a band. Yeah. Another band will have other experiences. But we didn't get that loaded to record that album. Maybe marijuana, but that's mostly Paul. Jack and Yarma weren't too, that big on marijuana. So you really were more, you were more focused than is storied. Yeah, we, we weren't that loaded for that record. And we had played all those songs over and over live so uh, we could do the album really fast. So you referred earlier to Sketches of Spain, which leads me right to White Rabbit, which leads me to originally having another title, which I'm going to let you tell us, and listening to music nonstop to get to that song. You know, people just think it's this little drug anthem, but there was a lot of sophistication and a lot of study that you did. Also, Miles Davis and Gil Evans did an album called Sketches of Spain, which knocked my socks off. And I took acid and listened to that over and over again uh, for about 24 hours one time. I was tw- I was Before I was in a rock and roll band, I was modeling. I was about 22. And uh, that was burned into my brain. And, uh, of course, flamenco music. Uh, I made a record, a, a, a soundtrack, actually. Jerry Slick was studying to be a c- cinematographer at San Francisco State. He made a film called Everybody Hit Their Brother Once, and I did a uh, Spanish thing for it. I don't know why. It's because that's what I could play on the guitar, and then overdubbed another thing on top of that, Spanish guitar. And there's something about that that just uh, Spanish stuff that... I like Edvard Grieg. dun 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 But it's not Spanish. It's Norwegian. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, I don't know why, but that's partly uh, why White Rabbit is Spanish, because I like it. <laughs> and Alice in Wonderland has been used by everybody, because everybody has that experience at some time, where they're living one kind of life, and then something flips a switch, and they go over here and go, wow. That happened with the 50s into the 60s. That happened with me as an individual, and most of the people I knew had that experience at that time. So the song is poorly written because I was writing it at the parents. They said, why are you taking these drugs? Why are, why are you doing this? They read us when we were little, Alice in Wonderland, who takes five different drugs in that book. They read us Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz. They fall down in a field of opium poppies, Mm -hmm. and suddenly they can see the Emerald City. They weren't paying attention. Why do you take these drugs? Why did you read me those books? (laughs) So I was writing that song back at the, at that time, uh, what we considered adults. One pill makes you larger, and one pill makes you small, and the ones that mother gives you Twenty four hundred Fulton Street, I pass it every day. <laughs> but I kind of look at that house. You know, there was the Laurel Canyon scene not far from where we yeah, were. Yeah. And I think that house was pretty much the center of the scene for a long time. Would you I agree? Don't know about that. I, I don't know about that. I think the Grateful Dead lived in a funky uh, Victorian, and that that was a scene too. So, yeah, but you painted that house black, and that house yeah. became legendary. We didn't do it because of the Rolling Stones song. It, <laughs> it, it was uh, it was just, uh, let's paint this thing black, because everything in that neighborhood, everything is straight. So if it's straight, uh, like looking at us, or the Grateful Dead, or any of the bands at the time, in a hotel lobby of a Hilton in New York City, in 1968, 
people would look at us as if we had snot coming out of our nose, you know. We were just, like, awful, and we loved it. <laughs> it's not one of those things where you're embarrassed. It's one of those things where you flaunt it, you know. <laughs> so we thought it was great. That neighborhood, there aren't any weird houses, except ours, painted black. It's white again, I'm sorry to tell you. Yeah, because nobody likes anything goofy like that. Is there a Jim Morrison story you've saved just to tell us? Tell us. I, he I never, want... The worst part of it is he never came back. Not because I'm so fabulous, because I have short legs and no tits at the time. Now I've got short legs and big tits. But I, <laughs> now I'm an old person, though. Uh, but at the time, I, I'm not that spectacular looking. I have kind of bow legs, they're kind of short, no tits, kinky black hair. So I was always amazed when anybody did come back. But uh, as Paul Kantner tried to tell China when she was a teenager, he said, don't get too excited about it if they want to screw you. Men will fuck anything. <laughs> and I thought, well, that's a little crude for, <laughs> for the kid. But it's basically true. They would prefer, men would prefer to have something that's really good looking. But... Uh, if there's nothing really good looking around, they'll take the ugly one who wants to do you. So that is a great segue to, we're going to get into the it music. It is? <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> Believe it or not, I have I'm a, waiting for well, this, Dennis. <laughs> I, have a, I have a segue. You're here. really weird. Uh, yeah. Thank you. I, I admit it. That's why we're doing this. But, but I do have a segue here. Do you think that you earned respect as a woman because you were willing to join in on the fun? No, I don't, yeah, I didn't care. But the fact that you were willing to say, I had fun, I did sleep with all these men, I oh, did yeah. that, that's like the anti, you know, in today's age, no one would ever admit to that at oh, this point. Oh, sure. It has to come out in a lawsuit. I'm sure that when they're not around me, they say, what a slut. I don't care what you think of me. I live my life, you live yours. I could call you stupid. So What? You are what you are, and you can feel really good about yourself, and you can feel really smart. That's just her opinion that I'm stupid. Who cares? So you've said that Volunteers was a blast to record, but that the results were disappointing. So where do you think... Where, where do you think... First of all, is that an accurate quote? Yeah, is that an accurate quote? I don't know. I, I have to think of... Yeah. I can't remember the lineup. I guess what I'm getting at is, as the airplane progressed... You know, it got more difficult to have hits. And yet, I don't know if the Airplane was ever a hits top 40 band, because, you know, there was progressive radio back then. But, yeah. but, but radio and everything was also changing along with the times. Yeah. Marty wrote songs that were radio-friendly more than we did, unless it was FM. Then they played albums and stuff. But uh, we just wrote stuff that felt honest from whoever... Honest for Paul, honest for Marty, honest for, uh, like, Embryonic Journey. It doesn't even have lyrics. And it's a fabulous song, and it's written by Yarma Kalkinen. That's honest from him. Honest from me is probably dark, sarcastic, and Spanish. Honest from Paul is let's all go to the moon together. And uh, that's kind of the David Crosby wooden ships, we're all leaving because you don't like us or we don't like you or something. That's Paul. And then Spencer didn't write and Jack didn't write. Yorma did, I did, Paul and Marty. So we had four writers, but they're all completely different. Unfortunately, and this happens with a lot of bands. Uh, members will think, oh, my stuff, I don't like their stuff. It's too something or it's not enough of blah, blah. I liked it because I thought it was a smorgasbord. You could choose. You got something different. It's not all the same. So I liked the fact that it was all different. You get blues and you get Paul going to the moon, Marty's love song, I'm dark. As our so I liked that. But the guys didn't. Jack and Yarma wanted to do their blues and be more honest and none of this uh, 
an eight by ten copies of you looking marvelous. He wrote a song, Yarma, uh, third week at the Chelsea. We went to New York to do nothing but publicity. And if there's anything Jack and Yarma didn't like, it's doing publicity. They're <laughs> they're musicians. I'm not. I'm a screw off who got lucky. You know, it looked like, hey, that looks like fun. I think I'll do that. And I got, I'm not a big musician. I can't read music. I don't know anything about music. I just hear stuff in my head and go to the piano and poke at it till I get it. They're musicians, and they're both very good at it. So uh, it, it depends on who you are, which member of the band. I'm sorry that they didn't see it as a whole. And I was just sort of, okay. I didn't know where Jack and Yarma were. We couldn't find them. They had gone to Europe, the Norse countries, Finland, Sweden, somewhere. We didn't know which country. To speed skate. They were both pretty good at speed skating. They were gone. So Paul and I just started making records. She'll suck on anything you give her. Stare at anything you that's shiny bright. Her voice cuts over the sea even when it's stormy, but she's only two feet high. She'll get high. Well, I didn't want that first half of the conversation with Grace to stop. Next week, we dig deep into the starship, her solo records, her art, and yet more politics. Grace Slick, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks very much for tuning in. Don't forget to listen and subscribe on iTunes so you don't miss the next Rhino podcast. Executive producer for Rhino Entertainment, John Hughes. Produced for Rhino Entertainment by Pop Cult and Rich Mahan Promotions. All rights reserved.